Hey, Beetle 60 listeners, everyone keeping healthy? I'm Larry as usual. He's Andy, 7,000 miles away. And yet, by the magic of modern technology, we sound like we're in the same room. Wait, what? We're not in the same room? And by the way, I think that you are the one who is 7,000 miles away. Yeah, it's all perspective, isn't it? Hmm. That's mind-blowing. Well, we're talking now 60 years, speaking of mind-blowing, 60 years after the start of March 1962. This episode will be a brief but info-packed discussion of the Beatles' rejection by Decca. How the boys took the news, what they had been expecting how this colored their beetling experience from now into the spring and summer of 1962, what they didn't know yet about later 1962, and so on. In fact, this show has three parts. Part one is the Decca rejection in February 1962. Then, you know, in our 60 years ago universe, Stu is still alive in March 1962. Um, We want to know what has he been up to since leaving the Beatles in July last year, 1961. And then part three, Ringo, what's he up to in spring 1962? Well, it sure was a roller coaster. Uh, Six months ago, they wondered if their career was over before it started. More recently, they were positive that they were about to get signed. Now, going forward, they were back to being somewhat unsure of where they were going. And that worry started with a supposed meeting between Dick Rowe of DECA and Brian Epstein. Well, had there been a lunch meeting at DECA building on the Thames, Dick's only interest in Brian would have had something to do with NEMS, I guess. Uh, He clearly wasn't interested in the Beatles at all. Brian would say the meeting was Beatles-related, maybe just to impress the boys, but nothing, I don't know that for a fact, (laughs) I'm just, you know, guessing. Nothing in Brian's story makes sense, though, and uh, frankly, it's not really an interesting question. Maybe the more interesting point is that Roe said that the meeting never happened. <laughs> yeah, so this is all, it's all, you know, no matter what we say, it's not, we're not going to know what's, what's correct, you know? Yeah. And nobody seems to know why Dick would order Mike Smith, his new underling, to uh, sign only one beat or guitar group. Was it a budgetary concern or a lack of belief in the genre's longevity? Or was it arbitrary or fickle or short-sighted, capricious? But then I think, what a dumb thing to spend time wondering about. Who cares? Uh, What matters is that the Beatles were declined. Right. They were not the one group chosen. Let's call this episode Beatles Rejected. Yeah. This is the first We begin with our segment called Where We Going, Fellas? Brian told the boys the bad news, each of them except Pete. Why keep it from Pete? Uh, maybe because Brian didn't care to get Mona's feedback. We don't know. I want to know how did Brian take the news, then how did John take it, Paul and George, how did they take it? Is it possible that John wanted to quit? I can imagine that. And Paul maybe wanted to become a Cliff Richard clone. (laughs) (laughs) And George just wanted to play guitar and, you know, without thinking much about short, plump business jerks. Things that was going nowhere, and this is a city deal, and a city 
address me. I say, where are we going, fellas? And they say, to the top, Johnny. And I say, where's that, fellas? And they say, to the top of most, to the top of most. I say, right. And we all say, cheer up. Well, I can tell you, Brian took the news very badly. In response to the famous Dick Rowe quote that groups of guitarists are on their way out. We've all heard that so many times. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, Epstein said to him, Well, you must be out of your mind. But these boys are going to explode. I am completely confident that one day they will be bigger than Elvis Presley. Mm. Now, to put this into a little bit of context... Rowe claimed that he never said the line about groups of guitars being on their way out, but it has gone down in history as being completely factual. Why? Mainly because Brian put it in his autobiography, A Cellar Full of Noise, and most other historians took it from there. That was the original source. That's the way history works. But back to the point. Uh, Paul would look back and say that the rejection heightened their determination, more determined to keep going. John, though, was disheartened once again. He said, We really thought that was it. That was the end. Mm. George's reaction brings up a not often told point. The fact was, Decca had not actually completely shown them the door. They did give the Beatles the opportunity to record a full-length album by paying an 18-year-old A&R man named Tony Meehan mm. to record them, mm. and that Decca would put it out. The fee that the Beatles would have to pay for this service would be around a hundred pounds. Doesn't sound like much, right? Well, that's about twenty-three hundred pounds today, or thirty-one hundred dollars. Mm. Uh, John, Paul, and George all remembered me and being in the studio at the January 1st recording audition, and George felt firmly that it was Mian who decided that the Beatles shouldn't be signed. So that was back, um, so Mian was there with Mike, right? Yeah, theoretically, yeah. They drove down during that snowy New Year's Eve, and it was New Year's Day, Yeah, and uh, the... And Mike showed up late. We don't know when Mian showed up. Mm. Uh, Mian seems like a real character. I just don't know. I, I don't know what to make of him. <laughs> Everything you read about him is kind of negative. Yeah. I looked in Wikipedia. Well, first of all, he was the Shadows' first drummer. Yeah. He he quit, and it was a big to do in the media about that. I don't I don't understand all that. And he's just eighteen or whatever, and like I'm getting offers every day from. He just like seemed really full of himself, but I don't really understand why <laughs> why he was so special <laughs> and treated himself as so special, you know. And I looked in Wikipedia. He later went on to study psychology of all things. He was an ardent Catholic, and and. Hmm. So at first I thought maybe he was like an Oxbridge type who was like putting down the Northerners, you know? Right. But, but they all had Irish descent. So I don't really, I don't get it really, you know? <laughs> we can't go at it from that angle really. It's just his personality. Anyway, Mian, who had been the Shadows drummer, quit to become a teen A&R man at Decca. And I think that Dick relied on him to be you know the teen scene. You can you can <laughs> suss out what the teen, whatever's happening, yes. That's right. What's going to be chic this month? Those who knew him described him as a haughty jerk, actually. And Harrison, a sagacious observer of human behavior, would easily uh, have perceived an incompatibility. The Beatles were a northern rock and soul group, and Meehan somehow looked down on them. He was from the South. Yeah. If you think about it, the shadows were kind of much more white than the Beatles, in a sense. Does that make any sense? I don't want to racialize this. I, I mean, I guess I hadn't thought of it that way before, uh, but much less of an influence of rhythm and blues. Um, yeah. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't sort of swing the way the Beatles did, like. And so, anyway, I, I don't, I don't want to overanalyze it, but, but he sometimes, he somehow looked down on them and George picked up on it and Brian certainly did. And Brian must have thought, who the fuck do you think you are? 
you know, although, of course, it wasn't written as coarsely as that in Cellar Full of Noise. Right. And years later, Meehan would say that George confronted him in 1968 about him blocking the Beatles recording contract. The sad part to me, and this is going off a little bit of a tangent, is that John Paul and George, and apparently Brian, didn't actually tell Pete about the rejection, like you said. You know, and is it, like you said, Larry, because of Mona? Who knows? I mean, that was just a guess. I have no idea. Yeah, exactly. But when Pete wrote his autobiography in 1985 called Beetle, the Pete Best Story, he said that he was told by the others that they were afraid he would take the result extremely badly. And his response to that was... I had to laugh in bewilderment. What kind of guy did they take me for? Hmm. It is really weird. And, yeah. It can't be the right reason. And there's not an explanation that I've found for it. <laughs> no, it makes it makes no sense. So it's like it's not the real reason, probably. But the saddest part to me is that Pete wrote that this had all taken place in March hmm. and that the others had made him wait for the news, he said, for days. Days. Yeah. So even then, 23 years after the events, when he was writing it, Pete didn't realize that he had actually been made to wait for several weeks. It was so important for Pete not to find out about the rejection that public statements weren't allowed. And articles in Mersey Beat and the Liverpool Echo came out around the time, both indicated that a DECA signing was imminent. So the media was misled uh, in the meantime, yeah. as they misled the bests. Gee, you know, that sounds almost like sadistic or something, or bullying. It does. I don't, I don't know if it gets better than that from, from that point. But again, we don't know the exact reasoning behind it either. But I wouldn't put it past the Beatles to be like that. Yeah. They all could be pretty pretty mean to each other sometimes, you know? Yeah. And especially to him, I guess. Or didn't feel like they owed him anything or something. Um, but, mm-hmm. but it's hard to imagine Brian, Mr. Fairness, feeling comfortable doing that. So there must have been some strong reason. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Because he wouldn't just do that to like, ha, 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 let's fuck with Pete. <laughs> right. You know, that's not something he would do. So there had to have been some kind of reason. And it's like, oh, he would take it so badly. <laughs> it's insane. So obviously there's some other reason, but we don't know it. Yeah. If anybody has any idea about that, hit that message button and, and <laughs> yeah. please send us a, a line. Mm. But this is not the thing. When this story comes up on Facebook or Twitter or wherever, you know, in the Twitterverse or the Facebookverse, Metaverse, (laughs) that's not the story that comes to people's minds. The guys who want to jump in all the time, uh, and I'm sympathetic to them in this case, the most common comment this rejection gets from so many guys, it's always guys. <laughs> I mean, I guess sometimes um, fangirls kind of have opinions about things, but not about this one. Uh, not not, not this, this kind of opinion, which is like, I know the real reason, or I know what's up. <laughs> I know what's up, you know? There's some mansplaining going on. Yeah, mansplaining kind of thing, <laughs> right. I have a grasp on the real situation. Let me tell you. You know, here's what I always say. <laughs> Many guys, 60 years later, have some variant of, it's the best thing that ever happened to them. Meaning that they and George Martin wouldn't have been connected if the, uh, this had worked out with Decca and, um, Decca had assigned this to Mike Smith or Tony Meehan. Mm-hmm. Um, this truth, this insight is often sort of propounded with an air of deep beetle expertise. <laughs> as if it's an original thought, but we all have thought it. (laughs) Facebook comments are often like that, even mine sometimes, but it's funny because, you know, in comments, you'll see five guys all commenting the same truth, and we all agree, and, you know, don't expect me to dispute it. We who live in the future (laughs) can look back 60 years and know that, yeah, they they were really lucky to be rejected by DECA. That's a true thing. Mm -hmm. And looking back at the whole canon of work that EMI's George Martin did with our beloved rock group, any historian can sound prophetic in hindsight. Not pathetic, but prophetic. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Uh, And that brings up something else I think about a lot. Why does everyone point to the Decca rejection as such an important plot point in the story of the Beatles? We're even talking about it right now. 
But the Beatles weren't only rejected by DECA. They had already been rejected by EMI, who would eventually sign them, and more rejections would be coming in the next several weeks. And we'll be talking a bit more about them in future episodes. Hmm. As I said earlier, yeah, the, the fact that the story is highlighted in Brian's book is probably one reason. Hmm. You know, but I also feel that the fact that the recordings from the January 1st audition still exist is another reason. It was not a common practice and therefore very fortunate from a historical standpoint that Dick Rowe or Decca allowed Brian to keep the recordings. He could use them in any way he wanted. So he could send them to labels or use them to try to get shows or whatever else. But the fact is that they had very little to nothing to do with why the Beatles ultimately got signed um, and are much more valuable to people who just want to hear what the Beatles sounded like in 1962 before they became the Beatles. Mm. <laughs> By the way, another comment that I see all the time is about how Decker was stupid and Dick Rowe must have kicked himself for the rest of his life. Yeah, you know, A&R work is like that. They're always trying to guess the new trends, and they get it wrong often. Uh, it could happen to, if any of us had been in Dick Rowe's position, we might have done the same thing. It must be a common occupational hazard. Hmm. I mean, compare Dick Rowe with George Martin. At first listen, neither of them understood the Beatles. Right. In the end, you've explained in a previous episode that the Beatles' way into Martin's parlophone was unconventional. They were sort of dropped on him, and he accepted them without any particular enthusiasm at first. Yeah. I'm wondering when Brian would shop around the DECA or de the DECA commercial test and, and include it maybe with his press package. Hmm. Was it an acetate, a, a vinyl acetate, or was it a reel to reel or what? Do we know? Does it matter? Wow, well, we probably we, we don't. should be able to find that out, but I don't know it offhand. <laughs> I don't know either. I don't know either. Listeners, or listener, I think we only have one listener, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. Listener, if you know that, please, please uh, message us. You know how. didn't know it, but he was as lucky as the Beatles were, having been connected in this almost offhand way. We've talked about how brilliant a matchup the Fab Four and George Martin happened to turn out to be. His ability to write parts with perfect taste for string sections or whatever classical players they brought in to fit particular songs, his willingness to abuse studio equipment. <laughs> he had done music concrete. He'd work with their favorite comedians, The Goon Show. I mean, what a match, you know? I, I, I don't know when they all re recognized it in each other, but yeah. I don't know. People hate what-ifs in history, but sometimes it's useful to think of a what-if, and this is this is obviously one of them that we all engage in. If Decca had signed them to work with Mike Smith or uh, Tony Meehan, would anybody even be talking about the Beatles today? The Tremolos, the, the group that they finally did go with, did okay eventually, but there haven't been hundreds of books written about the Tremolos, you know, yeah. and probably not any active Facebook groups about them, not that I know of anyway. No Disney Plus eight-hour documentary about the Tremolos. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Brian Poole and the Tremolos, yeah, so... They were the ones that Decca went with instead of the Beatles. Fun little fact. Yes. I want to be sure to um, credit a member of our Facebook group. It was 60 years ago today. Uh, it's the name of the Facebook group. 
I want to credit Zach, Zach Spencer, for pointing out that they had great original songs months later. They had to wrangle a little with George Martin. We're going into the future now, which is what we do in the podcast. Yeah. We go a little bit into the future. <laughs> and uh, he had advised them, and they had advised him on the songs and negotiated things. And, of course, these became their first hits. So I think it's a really good, really, really great insight from Zach. Yeah, and there is some misinformation out there based on exaggerations that were made in promo materials during 1961 and 62, uh, saying that John and Paul had already written a 100 songs or something by the time they were signed. And that's really just not true. Uh, they had written several, maybe 15 or so, fragments many of which you can see them recalling in the Get Back documentary. Mm. I'm sure you have already seen all of those. Um, Too Bad About the Sorrows and, and, and all of those. I think it was, um, um, by the way, I, sorry to interrupt you. I think it was yeah. uh, John wrote that in one of those like handwritten bios, you know? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, we've got a hundred songs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And yeah, Paul said that too. It was like, oh yeah, we've written all these songs. Uh, but yeah, you know, and they also had some recorded jam sessions and and those would have never even had names, except that they were given names by bootleggers, <laughs> mm. you know. Mm. But there were really only a few fully formed songs, like the ones they played live. Hello, Little Girl, Love of the Loved, Like Dreamers Do, none of which were actually recorded by the Beatles for official releases, although all of them... Yeah, for that January 1 DECA commercial test, right? Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, but they didn't record them for, you know, on their albums later. Right, you know? right. But they were all given away to other groups or singers. I would agree with Zach that it really was in the next few months coming up that the Lennon-McCartney machine really got going. Yeah, and so that, that's a really good takeaway uh, from Zach. And a good takeaway from this episode. Yeah. Everyone keep that in mind. <laughs> Let's watch the, the songwriting machinery happen in the next few months. Andrew Martin Adamson here. If you regularly listen to this podcast, and you should, you may know me better as Andy or possibly Barmy Old Codger. I'm interrupting our discussion to give you a heads up. I've been working on this 60 years project for almost five years, and I've decided it's time to retire the name Barmy Old Codger. <laughs> Barmy Old Codger worked fine as the name of a band, which is how it all started. But as I've moved into social media, blogging, podcasting, and book writing, it occurred to me that the name itself really didn't give any indication that the project was about the Beatles. So over the next few weeks, everything that currently carries the name will undergo a rebranding. In the future, you'll see my name, Andrew Martin Adamson, or the new blog name, The 60 Year Beatle Blog. So right now, you can still find me on Facebook and Twitter under the name Barmy Old Codger, and you still can find the blog at barmybeetleblog.com. I'll keep you informed when the change will take place permanently, but I just wanted you to be aware that it was coming. Thanks for listening, and now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. You know, in on social media, we try to uh, stick to the very day 60 years ago, but in the podcast, we try to kind of join things together, the recent past with the recent future 60 years ago. Yeah. So, for example, uh, right now, Stu is still alive at this moment 60 years ago. Um, why don't we back up for a minute and give ourselves um, an overall refresher yeah. on what he was up to in Hamburg while the Beatles 
had returned to Merseyside. Yeah, let's talk about Stuart Sutcliffe. Uh, in March of 1962, it had been about nine months since Stu left the Beatles to start fulfilling his life dream. And that wasn't rock and roll. Mm. He had moved in with Astrid Kircher, the love of his life, and returned to his real interest, which was art. He was studying at the Hamburg College of Fine Arts under world-renowned Scottish sculptor Eduardo Paolozzi, who was a first-generation Brit born to Italian immigrants. Paolozzi would ultimately be knighted in 1989, so that's Sir Eduardo Paolozzi to you. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Paolozzi had taken a one-year teaching assignment in Hamburg, and it was perfect timing for Stu. Paolozzi had something to say about Stu in 1967, and this is a quote. He had so much energy and was very inventive. The feeling of potential splashed out of him. He had the right kind of sensibility and arrogance to succeed. Stu hadn't completely forgotten about rock and roll, despite it taking a back seat in February of 1962. Mm -hmm. He joined a German band called The Bats for nine shows. The Bats, by the way, ultimately played in Hamburg for several decades. Oh. Of course... I like to use this fact, among others, from an argument that there is no way that Stu was as bad of a bass player as history makes him out to be Mm. if bands were asking him to join. Pete Best said, and here's a quote. Stuart took a lot of criticism about his bass playing from people who weren't there. I was, and there was nothing wrong with Stuart's bass playing. So there's that. Don't worry, by the way, it's not likely that I'll shut up about this. (laughs) Later in... Uh, February of 1962, Stuart's mother, Millie, was scheduled for an operation, so Stu headed back home to Liverpool for a few days. During that time, he hung out with the Beatles and reportedly met Brian Epstein. It's been said that there was even talk of Stu uh, becoming a sort of art director for the Beatles. But my favorite story (laughs) is how they all went bowling. And since Stu was still friendly with Alan Williams, Mm. he came along with them. The first time he had seen John, Paul, and George since he sued them for not payment of his commission for Hamburg bookings. <laughs> uh, no <laughs> factual report. There was, of course, the shadow that was cast over Stu's whole life for the last several months. Of course, it's heartbreaking, and uh, and we don't want to be morbid and, and focus on, on death, sickness and death, although nobody does escape it eventually. Yeah, exactly. Although not feeling better and maybe not optimistic about recovery. He was clearly ill. Yeah. He had seen doctors about his intense headaches and was ultimately told... He just needed to rest. A Liverpool doctor had even implied that Stu was simply a hypochondriac. During the Liverpool trip, comments were made about how bad he looked. Alan Williams said that Stu looked like death. He had a death power. Yeah. Stu is still alive and maybe expects to live. Or does he? He really eerily told Pete Best at the end of the trip, that it was the last time you would ever see him. Mm. It really is heartbreaking for us to know what they didn't know at this time 60 years ago, despite what looked like pretty big clues in hindsight. Uh, now, we'll be going into the details of the end of Stuart Sutcliffe's part in the Beatles story in the next episode, so I'll just leave it there yeah. for now. Good idea. Let's move on. Yeah. So just to remind people, at this point, uh, we have Stuart the ex-Beatle, so we have an ex-Beatle. We have a current Beatle who will one day become an (laughs) ex-Beatle. Actually, they'll all become ex-Beatles, won't they, eventually? Hmm. There is also an individual out there at this point who is a future Beatle. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe he deserves a little bit of attention at this point.
So, while the part of one player in the Beatles story was coming to a close, another was really just getting started. Mm. Uh, We've talked about what Ringo was up to some in the past, but just to quickly recap, he was not terribly satisfied with the career trajectory of Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. He had considered leaving the UK altogether and heading to Texas, but that plan fizzled out. So when the offer came in late 1961 to join Tony Sheridan in Hamburg, he took it. Mm. He was there from January through the first half of February in 1962. Uh, He didn't love it. There are stories that he didn't like the way Tony Sheridan would change songs without warning uh, and how he, Tony Sheridan, would get into fights with audience members. Um, On February 7th, his grandmother, Annie Starkey, died and he wouldn't be there for the funeral. Uh, Ten days later, a massive storm hit Hamburg and caused widespread flooding and power outages. Uh, Over 300 people were killed. We should note that the flood that, you know, people think that Hamburg is completely flat. But Jesse from our group pointed out that the Reeperbahn is kind of up a slope a little bit. There's a little bit of a slope. Yeah. So that parts of Hamburg were underwater and then parts were just, uh, you know, power outages and that sort of thing. Ringo had finally had enough and returned to Liverpool, where Rory welcomed him back to the Hurricanes. So... At this point, is Ringo like a free agent or is he um, attached to Rory Storm and the Hurricanes or the Hurricanes or what? Um, That's inquiring minds want to know. On a few occasions, Ringo would sit in with the Beatles when Pete was sick. We've talked about that before. Mm. Now, that wasn't a completely uncommon occurrence either, someone sitting in due to illness. In fact, once Jerry Marsden... Uh, sat in for George when he was ill. Wow. But with Ringo, it was somewhat more than that. Our young Mr. Harrison was regularly campaigning uh, and trying to convince John and Paul to bring Ringo in permanently. Mm. He had actually at one point talked to Elsie Starkey, Ringo's mom, um, and told her that the Beatles wanted her boy. Uh, but it would still be a little while before things would really start to happen in that area. Yeah. And meanwhile, Ringo was given a couple more choices. Uh, Tony Sheridan was about to start playing at the Star Club in Hamburg. He wanted Ringo back, and the offer that the Star Club made was impressive. Uh, He was to have more money, an apartment, and the use of a car. Uh, At around the same time, Howie Casey and the seniors offered Ringo a chance to join them on a tour of British ballrooms. Uh, But ultimately, uh, Ringo would decide that his best opportunity, the one that he liked the most, uh, was to stick with Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, uh, who were going to do a tour of U.S. Army bases in France and Spain, and then settle in for a third Butlins summer, this time in Skegness. And Ringo really liked the Butlins life. Um, that would run from June until September of 1962. Mm-hmm. And spoilers, he didn't quite make it to the end of that. The Beatles 60 podcast comes out twice a month. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Just search Beatles 60, B-E-A-T-L-E-S-6-0, with no space, for example, in Apple Podcasts. Yeah, and thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, We'll have more about labels and other things coming soon. Things are getting really exciting and sometimes tragic over the next few months, so stay tuned. Things will get very tragic for a moment. They will. Uh, You don't need to wait two weeks to keep up with the timeline, though. You can check on Andy's blog called Barmy Beetle Blog, where there are posts every Friday? Every Friday, yes. Yes, every Friday. If you're on Facebook, you can get involved in the group called It Was 60 Years Ago Today. 
uh, that I manage along with Grant Adrian Heaton. It overlaps a lot with Andy's page on Facebook called Barmy Old Codger. Mm-hmm. Uh, almost exactly the same kind of post at the same day. They're similar, yes. Um, both give you a daily feel for the story and both are recommended they're slightly different approaches so read both and remember it was 60 years ago today is in groups on facebook and barmy old codger is a page on facebook yes so if you're searching that might help you and there are there are going to be links to everything we talked about that you can check out so please do Thanks so much to Eric Howell for lending his voice. Thank you so much, Eric. All quotations in this episode of Beatles 60 were voice acted. That's right, acted by friend of the pod, Eric Howell, yeah, Eric. as just mentioned. <laughs> in this episode's show notes, you can find the link to the audio drama series he directs and produces A Day in Their Life. We're big fans, heck. Yes. We're almost stands. Oh, yes. What's the What's the last word for today, Andy? Say the word. Oh, oh wait, that hasn't happened yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, take care, everyone. Stay safe. Larry, I'll be talking to you soon. Be well, my friend. in 97 mega rates in stereo and now a message from our sponsor this is brian or epi as the boys are fond of calling me i hope you've enjoyed today's episode of beatles 60 the beatles at their heart are storytellers i'd like to invite you to go even deeper into their story by listening to another program called a day in their life an audio drama of the Beatles' story. Both Andy and Lawrence agree. It's simply marvellous. For details, visit Beatledrama.com or see the show notes for this Beatles 60 episode for the link. Thank you. Thank you. Here's our number again, 0612286262, and it's contest time. Do it slow. No. One, two, three, power. In the beginning, I misunderstood. But now I've got it The word is good The Captain Rick 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 Remake